So our next speaker is uh, Renee Loveland, and uh, she's going to, she represents uh, Girding Edland uh, Development in Portland, and she's going to give us uh, some good information about how they look at the world and this, this issue that we're looking at. So please welcome Renee. Good morning, everyone. I hope you're enjoying the symposium so far. I'm standing in for a colleague of mine, Matt Eadlin. He's our director of marketing and leasing for our properties. And I wanted to make sure that you knew that he put some time and effort into this and had hoped to share it with you himself today, but unfortunately is uh, on business out of, out of uh, state right now. So I am, uh, my name is Renee Loveland, and I've been with Girding Eland for 15, 16 years now, since the company was established, basically, and I'm the sustainability manager there. I've worn a few different hats over the years and have the great fortune of working for a company that does a lot of great sustainable development work uh, here uh, locally as well as in other markets. And one of the things that makes us really unique in our approach to sustainability is the importance that we place on the end product and giving back to the community. Now, I know that sounds a little bit cliche and trite, but it, it's really um, a balancing act that we go through on every project to make sure that we are incorporating uh, the features in the design as well as uh, the elements uh, in the amenities that will make it a place for people. And so that's what this discussion is a little bit about. We are st talking about green roofs still, bear with me. But what we are going to be looking at is kind of what is the link between something like a green roof and sustainability and uh, this next wave that we see in sustainable development. So I'm going to take you back in time a little bit and start with uh, kind of an older model of, of, of real estate development in, yeah, at the time. This is obviously a, an iconic project, project for the city, but what's really being offered here? We have uh, a very uh, snazzy looking uh, building, um, something very iconic. We have a lot of the spaces that are needed in this building to meet the needs of the landlord and the potential tenants. So there's a lot of attention made to the mixed use retail components. So things are looking really good. And then you've also got this great uh, metropolitan ba backdrop. You're in the you know, urban core of the city. But what's missing in this picture? What about the people? Where are the people? What do they want? How do they fit into this building? OK, so there's, there's a few that we captured there. But really, that's what this is. This is a lot of what our thinking is about. It's looking at these older values of development and really looking at how that has changed and how we need to serve the market today. So back in the day, we paid a lot of attention to form. You have to obviously meet the needs that tenants have in the building, function, lots of private offices, things were very structured that way. You kind of just want to go through the motions and make sure you're checking all the boxes. Uh, efficiency. You know, how much can you pack into this space? Uh, how much uh, economic value can you get from just that very basic uh, approach? But what happens to all of the building uh, users, all the people that interface with the building, all the people that are really making the building what it is? Where do they fit in? Well, in our thinking, people want to be in places where they have a different experience than what the older values of development provided. So what are the values of the new school of development? For us, we see that as places where collaboration is easily fostered. And so that's an environment that's more open, where there are more opportunities to connect with your colleagues and the people around you. A lot of nature, access to these various elements that are really at the heart of sustainable, sustainability, bringing those into the experience for the user. And then finally, creativity. People want uh, 
places that are inspiring, places that are beautiful, places that speak to them in some way. We spend an awful lot of time working uh, at our office. We spend a lot of time in our homes. We spend a lot of time in buildings. We want them to be um, great places. So what do we have? We have this old school where form, function, and efficiency kind of reigned, and this newer school of collaboration, na nature, natural environments, and, and creativity. So there's this juxta juxtaposition that, that we see because we are out there doing a lot of development projects and we're want, we want to meet the needs of our users in the market. So there's the old approach and then this newer approach. And this older approach was one very much based and rooted on process. We see the newer approach very focused on people. So people, it's about people. And what do those people want? So we spend a lot of time looking at the, this question and trying to answer this question in the context of our building. So bear with me, I know. So people, they have a lot of different needs, a lot of different value sets, a lot of things that they're looking for in, in how they experience their buildings. And here's just a smattering of examples. And along the lines of sustainability, which is something that we focus very heavily on in our built environment, we want to address the needs and the values of these people. That's how our projects are going to be successful. So let's talk a little bit just about Generation Y. We have heard a lot of talk about this phenomena that we are living these days. And the fact of the matter is that they are a huge, huge market. Um, there are various statistics that we pulled from that are cited here, so um, you have that for your reference. But this market that is going to continue to grow, they are going to be looking for the kinds of places that reflect their values. They want to be in workplaces and homes that share those values. So we again, spend an awful lot of time bringing those elements into our buildings, whether it's through the amenity spaces, the bike parking, the actual um, maintenance facility for taking care of the bikes that people ride, the dog washes, the, uh, the open spaces, and the plantings and the, the, the green spaces that we incorporate into our buildings. So just to give you a little bit more context on this, uh, this is a study that, uh, that we like to look at because it was very broadly based. And it tells a lot about what this, the, these, this generation is really looking for. So what they're looking for are the kinds of things that um, are going to provide them connectivity, primarily. And work, working and living, mostly working, I'm talking about the working context here, is something very social. And they want something where they can feel engaged and they can have the sense of community. They don't want to go to work and go through the motions and not feel connected to their coworkers or connected to their surrounding environment. So these, are, these quality of life issues are very, very important. They're looking for jobs that are located in an urban core. They want to be able to use public transportation. Again, the notion of sustainability rises here. And they want to um, be very cognizant about um, how they're interacting uh, on that basis with their transportation alternatives. They are very focused on, again, connectivity, creativity, collaboration. And if you look at this, um, they are more apt to want to work in these open environments, which are very different from the kind of older form that we talked about earlier. Finally, they want to be in a place where they can be around other people. They want to go to the office, they want to have that experience, and they want to have their own place. So it's a personal experience. So they're taking their values with them and looking for an expression of that in where they work and where they live. So this is an interesting stat. It kind of shows that during you know, the downturn, if you will, when things were really tough for a lot of people, 
um, Generation Y were less hardly hit than uh, folks that fell into other age groups. And alternatively, what we saw when things started to get better is that they had a huge uptick as far as return to full employment. Now, all of those jobs that this generation is um, having access to again and will continue to grow is creating this economic prosperity, this growth. And so again, what are they going to be looking for? They're looking for a place that is going to speak to their values. And again, those values range from all those things that we saw on that one slide, but really the sustainability is something that is, is pretty important to this age group, to this demographic. So whether you look at it through sustainability or the quality of design or uh, the amenities, the things that are in the building, what we have seen is that we can get premiums in our LEED certified buildings, in our green buildings that pay attention and speak to this vast value set. It's not just about sustainability, it is about design, it is about making places where people can connect, but the sustainability piece is in there. And when you have a stronger performing asset, you see financial returns, and we have experienced that directly. So again, going back to this generation Y, you know, and sustainability, Specifically, they, they talk about how they want to work for an employer that espouses environmental values. They want to be in a place where they experience that. And they actually are looking for you know, their, their potential employers to go above and beyond. Um, you, know, you hear about college students today who select colleges um, with, uh, while paying attention to whether or not they have a sustainability agenda. These kinds of things are very important across a lot of different choices that these people make. They want to see and feel the greenness in their workplace. So how do they get some of that? Well, we feel that they can experience that directly through the addition of green spaces and open spaces and public places within the buildings. So as a few examples of some projects that we have done, uh, these are all Portland projects, but again, we have done and are currently doing projects in other markets up and down the West Coast and on the East Coast as well. This is the Louisa Apartments here in Portland at the Brewery Blocks. You might be familiar with this. And we have uh, green roofs on the podium level that you see there at the courtyard. And we also have um, um, green roofs on the other, the, the other side of this uh, tower component. So it's covering both of the podium components there. The 12 West building, Indigoa 12 West, um, is a great project that also has green roof plantings on the uh, 22 story, 22nd story roof, I believe, up at the penthouse level. And those are, um, the, obviously the stormwater detention benefit is being uh, met by that system, but we're also capturing the rainwater and using it to flush toilets uh, in the building. And then Cyan, uh, it's a, right, a project right by Portland State at 4th and Harrison. And this one has a, a really neat, um, it, it's a little bit hard to see because the image is somewhat small, but there on the top right corner, you can see the big screen that's in the courtyard. So when we first opened the building, we invited residents to come together in the planted courtyard area and um, created these events as a way to get everybody to know one another and get comfortable with the new building. So again, the Generation Y, the value set that they have, huge, huge market huge market. Everybody's paying attention to what they want when they're thinking about what kind of a building they're going to design and build. There is a huge emphasis on their values. We, we see that in the choices they make. They want these things and they have the economic wherewithal to demand them. So we're paying a lot of attention to this. And if you think about it from a triple bottom line approach, you've got people, planet, prosperity. We've all heard about this before. But in our minds, this notion of people is really 
what rises to the top. They are the ones that are going, the collective choices that we make are going to drive the changes from an environmental and sustainability standpoint. And that in turn leads to economic prosperity for all of us. So to kind of wrap up a little bit, we really see that we are at this turning point where there's a big shift in demographic and as a real estate developer, we have to pay a lot of attention to that. They want to experience these things. And so it's not enough to talk about it. It's not enough to put one or two things in the building. But something like a green roof for a developer becomes almost an imperative. I might be going a little far in saying that. But what my point is that it's one element that gives your whole the capability to outperform in the market. We have to pay attention to this, and we're not the only ones doing it. Employers, uh, large companies that rent space in our buildings, they do it because they want to capture the best talent out there. They want those employees working for them, and those employees are looking for those things. So there's this trickle-down effect that we see taking place. I'll just close with this quote from Dennis Hayes, the founder of Earth Day and president of the Bullet Foundation. They're actually in the process of doing their um, headquarters building, which is going to be a living building. And as he states here, he feels more confident than ever that the power to save the planet rests with the individual consumer. Thank you. Uh, the question was, do I have a sense of how many of our current buildings in process are going uh, to ha include vegetative plantings or green roofs? We have seven projects that are currently either under construction, just opened, or in design. And I think that all but two of them have green roofs. The one that one of the ones that does not have a green roof is in Southern California, in Venice Beach, and it has a solar hot water system that serves 70% of the building's load on an annual basis. The other one is a tower in Boston that will hopefully, it's still, we're going through the end of design yet, so we're hoping to get some plantings on it, but I said no to be conservative, and it will have a PV system. Uh, that will take up a lot of the usable area. Since it's a tall tower, there's not a lot of space. So we compete for space with mechanical systems and you know, penetrations and other things that you have to have. So that's one of the big challenges. Absolutely, absolutely. We um, see the planted areas as a way to bring you know, nature to uh, the urban environment and get all of the stormwater and other benefits, but it's certainly an amenity for the residents. Most of our amenity spaces in our urban infill buildings are up on the roof. And so we make those spaces really engaging for people. And uh, most of the green roof spaces are, you know, not accessible in the sense where, you know, people stand on them, but they're open to where, you know, people are right there and surrounded by it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the question was, uh, how do we decide who gets access to the eco roofs, and at what point do we decide that you know nobody gets access, and are there ones that she can or that people can visit here? Um, so absolutely, if you tour any of our buildings, 
um, we can provide um, access to show the green roof up on the roof, the amenity space, not a problem. And there are buildings here in, in town that you can go visit. Um, the Louisa, the Cyan, those are buildings that we no longer own. The 12 West building is owned by an investor group of which we are a part, and it is one that we can definitely show you. It's lovely. I would encourage you to see it. Um, so that's the answer to that question. Um, most of the time, the eco roofs are made accessible, and most of the time, they're not exclusive to any particular resident group. So they're open to all of the residents, except in some small instances where we have some roofs that are directly on the terrace part of you know, a condominium owner, for example. So if you go down to South Waterfront, some of the condominium buildings that we co-developed with Williams and Dame, and you'll see that that whole district is just plastered with green roofs. Um, it's great amenity. It's so wonderful for the people that live there to be looking down on all of that greenery for one, uh, but to your point, there are some uh, green roof areas that are restricted to certain condo owners because that's just the way it was designed. But no, otherwise they're accessible to everyone in the building. Uh, the question was on the survey that Oxygen um, conducted that was um, led by um, a lady from Johnson Controls. Uh, what was the survey set? Was it nationwide or a particular area? My understanding, I believe it was nationwide. I honestly would have to double check that. Yes. He's the man. <laughs> so the question was about incentives uh, for green roofs. Uh, what we do see, there are a lot of jurisdictions that um, are still offering uh, height bonuses or density bonuses for green roofs. And so that's the very tangible, real benefit to a developer. Um, but aside from that, the financial support for like direct grants and financial support seems to be fairly limited. Um, I'd say here in Portland, we have some great programs. Yes? Can you speak to how, how the vegetative roots has helped activity and the quickness of space in the market? So the question is, can I speak to how the green roofs have helped occupancy and the spaces rented? And I can't. I can't speak specifically to the green roof. Uh, we don't survey our residents to the point where they tell us that they rented or leased a, a unit because it, of the green roof. It go, kind of goes back to that parts of the whole and uh, what we're really good at as a development company is making sure that we bring together an appropriate amount of those elements to respond to that desire by the user. And you know, in certain markets it's different. You know, Our project in Venice Beach is much different than our project in Boston. Um, the outreach that we do within the community is very different. We engaged heavily with the artist community in Venice. We will do some of that as well in Boston, but there are some other approaches that we also need to emphasize in order to really respond to what they want to see. But the green roofs, it's um, really my, my hope in sharing this story, uh, this kind of a story with you, and I think Matt's hope was uh, to give you that perspective from a developer standpoint of, you know, yes, there are costs involved, and, and as Ed shared, it's not an easy decision. We always want to do these wonderful things, those of us who espouse sustainability and, and, and all, but there are realities about the financials of the situation. And so it, it, it is a real trade-off, but we, um, we want, we have to put a certain amount of that into our buildings for them to be the kind of building that we hold ourselves to the standard of developing. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, now we're going to break for lunch, and do you all know where you're going? Or maybe Matt's going to come up and... Let me introduce Matt, who will tell you 
what we're going to do next. 